Welcome to That's the Word, wholesome tales for the whole family. I'm Father James Yamauchi. Today's story, The Ninth Day. Mother Superior entered the sick room, then broke down completely. Laying huddled in a fetal position on that bed was a young postulant named Mary. Mary was a Presbyterian convert who, against her parents' wishes, began discerning a vocation to the convent. However, the day before she was to receive the veil and become a novice, she began bleeding internally and vomiting up blood. She could not hold down any solid foods, and even water disgusted her. As the days turned into weeks, her condition only worsened. The doctor had eventually instructed the sisters to not give her any food or medication unless she asked for it. At this point, he said, it would be cruel to force any prolongation of her misery. The sisters were praying for their dear postulant, but it seemed like they were going to lose her. Through it all, Mary never once complained. She only asked that Mother Superior reach out to her parents and let them know that she had always and would always love them. Now Mary lay curled up in that bed, sickly and weak, her fingertips blue, blood dried in her mouth. Wiping the tears out of her eyes, Mother Superior went up to Mary and asked her, My child, would you like to receive our Lord once more? Mary nodded slightly. Her tongue was so swollen that her words were unintelligible. The priest came and broke the smallest fragment of the consecrated host. He instructed the nurse to give Mary some water to help her swallow the sacrament. When she did so, Mary erupted into convulsions, crying out in pain. Once they got her settled again, the sisters went to chapel for Mass, leaving Mary to rest in the sick room. As she left, Mother Superior did not know if Mary would still be alive when she returned. After Mass, Mother Superior made her way back to the sick room. When she opened the door, she stopped in her tracks. Mary was sitting up in the bed, healthy and smiling. Mother Superior could not believe her eyes. Surely, this cannot be the same girl that she left less than an hour ago. The nurse returned and was likewise speechless. To prove her health, Mary asked for a glass of water and drank the whole thing without vomiting, without convulsions, without any pain. When the doctor arrived and examined her, he was also dumbfounded. It may have been possible for Mary's condition to improve, but not to have the disease 
disappear without a trace. Her illness and bleeding had vanished at a moment's notice. The doctor could not explain how, but Mary could. Mary had with her a picture of a young man. After she received communion, she had prayed in her heart, Lord, thou who seest how I suffer, if it be for your honor and glory and the salvation of my soul, I ask through the intercession of this young man a little relief and health. Otherwise, give me patience to the end. I am resigned. Clutching the image of the young man, she thought, if it be true that you can work miracles, I wish you would do something for me. If not, I will not believe in you. Open your mouth, a voice said. Mary tried as best she could. Someone put his finger on her tongue. Immediately, Mary felt relief. The voice said again, Sister, you will get the desired habit. Be faithful. Have confidence. Fear not. Mary opened her eyes and saw a young man surrounded by lights holding a cup. Suddenly feeling fear, she closed her eyes and asked, Is it you? Yes, he answered. I come by the order of God. Your sufferings are over. Fear not. Mary opened her eyes again, but the young man was gone. She was alone, and she was not in pain. She sat up. She rolled around in her bed. Still no pain. Mary had been cured. This young man was not a stranger to the sisters. They had been praying a novena to him for Mary's recovery. On the ninth and final day of that novena, he visited Mary and brought God's healing with him. None of them had met this young man while he was alive. He had died 200 years before at the age of 22. A seminarian in Rome studying for the Jesuits. The healing of Mary Wilson at the Society of the Sacred Hearts Convent in Grand Gateau, Louisiana was recognized as his canonization miracle. A young man of extraordinary virtue who reached great holiness in his short life. St. John Birchmans. And for this week, that's the word. Today's story was suggested by June. 
Thanks, Gene, for suggesting this one. I was not aware that there was such a cool miracle that happened just one state over from us. That's correct. And how much documentation we have of it. That's the other cool thing in terms of the details of the story regarding Mary. And we were talking before we went on air about Mary's uh, life. And unfortunately, she did not live much longer after this occurrence where she was cured of her illness. No, she died about three years later. You know, what's fascinating about novenas, I love novenas. I'm just really bad about praying the novena all the way. You know, the period of prayer for nine days. But it's beautiful how he was able to come on this ninth day as they ended the novena, asking God through the intercession of St. John Berkman's for the healing of Mary. And for those who aren't aware, a novena is where you set aside nine days of prayer. Hence the term novena. To some particular cause, typically. So you're typically praying for nine days. There's no really set prayers that you do. It's just that you're consistently praying for a series of nine days for a specific intention. The biggest and most important novena, of course, is the Pentecost novena from the Ascension until Pentecost Vigil. And that's, of course, rooted in the scriptures, right? The apostles followed our Lord's command to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. So they prayed those nine days between the Ascension and Pentecost for the coming of the Spirit. The trivia question for today's story is, Nowadays, how many approved miracles does a holy person need before the church will canonize them? That question again is, Nowadays, how many approved miracles does a holy person need before the church will canonize them? That's a very good question. And speaking about canonization and popes and St. John Berkman's, it's interesting, he was at the Roman College, which nowadays the building that was the Roman College in Rome is actually a high school. I remember one time that uh, there was some protest going on. It seemed like the kids were protesting something. I was like, I don't know if that was a class on how to protest because in Italy there was a lot of protests going on. In, in society, so I wasn't sure if it was official class or they were upset about something. They were protesting bad protests. <laughs> <laughs> but, but So I would pass by the old Roman college where St. John Berkman's uh, attended as a seminarian. That university is now at the Pontifical Gregorian University. That's where the Jesuits are currently teaching, and I'm an alumnus of that university. Around the corner of the present-day university is the Church of Dodici Apostoli, the Church of the Twelve Apostles. Saints Philip and James are buried there, two of the apostles, but also Clement the Fourteenth. Now, what's fascinating about Clement the Fourteenth is he was the Pope in the 18th century who suppressed the Jesuits, and the Jesuit order was suppressed for a brief period of time. And so there's an interesting tradition that the American seminarians do who study at the Jesuit University. Once we get our theology degree, after three years of our studies, there's an unofficial formal procession from the university going right around the corner to the Dodici Apostoli, where we lay flowers at the tomb of Clement the Fourteenth. Did any of the other students join you for that, or is it just the Americans? See, I don't remember other people doing that, but maybe maybe they did. I'm sure St. John Berkman's probably had a, maybe a little smile in heaven as he watched us. Maybe just a tad bit out of mercy. If you enjoy That's the Word, please share the word. You can see the story extras for this story, The Ninth Day, at thunderrock.org where you can see a picture of Mary Wilson and St. John Berkman's. Thunderrock.org is also where you can sign up for our weekly newsletter and where you can find our social links and our email if you have any feedback or story ideas like June. Thanks for listening and join us next Wednesday for another wholesome tale for the whole family.